All right, hello everybody. Thank you for coming out on this beautiful day. It's tough to drag yourself away from the blue skies and the, uh, the sun and those temperatures that have gotten above 60 degrees. Very welcome. So um, thank you for inviting me down to talk about the, uh, the Clean Heat Standard Bill. Uh, the new, big news that came out today is the Senate did vote to override the governor's veto by one vote. It was a 20 to 10 vote. One vote. If one vote had flipped, the, the vote I was hoping was your very own Senator Dick Sears from here, but he ended up, uh, he ended up voting yes. Uh, yes. I have a question about this. I was uh, told by the um, uh, Sergeant of Arms that the Senate had it on their calendar for June, and, um, and then I was told by another person, uh, well, it's going to go to the House first, and they were going to vote maybe this week. So. How is it that they just do whatever they want? Well, <laughs> well, because the leadership sets the schedule. The, the Senate president sets the schedule for what comes up. But um, they did schedule a veto session for June 21st and 22nd, or 20th and 21st, something like that. But what appears on the calendar at that veto session is up for debate. Um, they just wanted to put something on the calendar so everyone knew when they would have to come back should they have, should the governor override or, or should the governor veto anything that takes place you know like friday they hope to they hope to hope to be gone so if they pass a bill on friday the governor vetoes it then they have to come back that date was set for june 20th but since the governor vetoed s5 when he did uh, they can they can have their override vote anytime they they please and the Senate, I, I think the tradition, I'm not sure if it's tradition or rule, that uh, the body that puts forward the bill uh, votes first on the override. So this is a Senate bill this year, S5, so they voted first. And last year it was H715, a House bill, so the House voted first, where, where it went down. So, so uh, now it, it's, there will be a vote in the House. It's either going to be Thursday or Friday. It's a, it's a much longer shot. There are just too many, too many that have to flip. Uh, from yes votes in the past to no votes, but that doesn't mean don't try. Uh, call your representatives, call Representative James, call Representative Bongarts. Um, here in Manchester, I know that you know, Representative Corcoran in, in Bennington is one of those folks that looks like he might have a little common sense on this. But it's tough. Their arms are being twisted really hard. Uh, the Speaker of the House was embarrassed last year when this failed by one vote. She thought she had 100, and Thomas Bach um, prayed on it. And when he was in the chair, he said no, uh, much to <laughs> the embarrassment of the Speaker of the House. So she's not going to let that happen again. She will not let that happen again. And they've got, you know, the, the vote in the House was, a, a, a hundred, a, was 98 to 46 with a few people, five people missing. Um, and one of the people missing was a Republican, that's 47. And then the other four, one was on the committee that voted yes, and another is a progressive from Burlington, and she's going to vote yes. So it's really 103 to 47, or 102 with the Speaker presiding. If she has to vote, it'll be 103. Um, so that, that's sort of where it stands. But you, know, you, you never know. If, you know. if people are loud enough and angry enough and, and um, make their voices heard, and really, the, the message has to be, if, if you vote for this, we're never voting for you again. That's the only kind of accountability that that they will listen to. Um, sadly, that's what it is. But they, they've been getting thousands of calls from you know, people like everybody in this room. Uh, you know, Dick Sears himself said this was the first time the Senate voted on this. So this is, you know, he's probably gotten thousands more. He said, we have gotten thousands of calls. Randy Brock, uh, the senator from Franklin County, the Republican uh, minority leader in the Senate, uh, testified on the floor uh, or not testified, but said on the floor in his remarks, I've gotten over 700 phone calls about this bill alone. Three were in favor of it. I mean, well, it, it, it's, it's ideological for them. Um, as I said, the, the speaker was humiliated that this thing failed last year, so she's putting pressure on people. If you want a committee chair, Chairmanship, you better be on board with this. If you don't want us to primary you, you better be on board with this. Um, so that's that's you know what people do. They they fall. I mean, if you've ever been if you've ever been in a state house, uh, 
the Democrats have a sign that the, the, uh, the uh, majority leader will sit in the front corner and for every vote holds up a sign, yes or no, and that's how you're expected to vote. You're not electing. When, when, you, when you go to the polls and you elect somebody from that party, you're not electing that person. You're voting for that sign. That's really sad. All right, so the clean heat standard after that. <laughs> it, that introduction, which uh, um, wasn't where I, huh? I want to go to the next slide. There we go. Uh, so what I wanted to talk about today is um, really uh, there's several sort of untruths that are being told about the clean heat standard from those who are, who are pushing it forward. There's a lot, you know, everybody's saying there's misinformation, there's misinformation, you're saying it's misinformation, you're, you're throwing out misinformation, but, but there, there, there are four big untruths about this bill uh, that we're gonna delve in today. Uh, the, the first one um, it being that it, it's not a tax. Uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, uh, another um, issue that somebody asked me before is about the check back provision because they're saying, oh, well, it's really just a study. It's not just a study. They're, they're, they're standing up the bill. Uh, the 70 cents uh, a gallon, which is the number that's been out there since January, uh, they're saying, oh, that's, that's number's wrong. And that, that's not necessarily untrue, uh, but they're saying that it's just going to be a few cents and we'll break down uh, how that's not going to be the case. And the other, I think the cruelest of all the misinformation that's being put out there is that, oh, this bill is somehow going to help low-income Vermonters when nothing could be further from the truth. Um, just, so to start, though, let's just give, give a little bit of background. And this is also why this is important. The clean heat standard is not, so, it's not a standalone bill. Uh, the clean heat standard is actually a, a leg of the Global Warming Solutions Act. The Global Warming Solutions Act uh, requires that Vermont reduce our greenhouse gas emissions to 26% below 2005 levels by 2025, which is not far away, 40% uh, below 1990 levels by 2030, and 80% below by 2050. So whatever we are doing, it, the, the, the clean heat standard is how we achieve those goals in the thermal sector of our economy, how we heat our, the air in our houses, how we heat the water in our houses, and how we uh, cook our food. That, that's what's covered with this. There's going to be another bill probably next year that is gonna do something very similar to this for transportation. That's how we drive, that's gasoline and diesel. I'm sure you will invite me back <laughs> to talk about that bill in a year. Um, but this is just the thermal sector. So when they say, uh, you know, We'll see what we're able to do when, when we study this and, and it'll come back and you know, if, if, if we can't do certain things, then you know, it won't be that expensive. Well, the mandate is that we have to reach these goals. And the clean heat standard is set up, the language in the clean heat standard, it says, it is the intent, uh, let, let, I, I saw the hand, I'll, I'll, I'll get to the hand in just a second. I just wanna finish this thought. Uh, it's the intent of the General Assembly that the clean heat standard be designed, implemented in a manner that achieves Vermont's thermal sector greenhouse gas emission reductions necessary to meet the requirements of 10 BSA sec subsection 578, which is the previous slide I just showed you. It's those goals is what all that BSA stuff is referring to. So this is not up for debate about how much greenhouse gas reduction we have to do. So it's not like, oh, well, it's too expensive to have a dollar twenty a gallon tax on home heating fuels, so we'll just cut it back to say thirty cents a gallon and pay for what we can pay for with that. That's not an option. The way this law is written, we have to meet, we have to meet these goals, or we can be sued. So, what was your question? So, this, these laws came about by our own state legislature. Yes, the Global Warming Solutions okay. Act passed uh, two thousand twenty. From the UN Agenda 2030? Uh, well, 
I, I, I don't know exactly about the UN agenda, uh, but y yes, there's a lot of, you know, from in Europe and the, uh, and, um, a lot of the climate organizations that are national and international have very similar goals uh, around 2025, 2030, 2050. Uh, some states have 90% reduction, we have 80% reduction. Uh, some states, I think California has a 100% reduction, but they're all pretty similar. It, it's, it's, it's coming from, uh, the, the, you know, the, the, the global warming alarmist contingent that is, is prevalent within our culture. Um, and the, the bill came about, passed in, in 2020 over the governor's veto that time as well. So sustaining vetoes is something that would be good if we would be able to do so long as we have a governor that's willing to, to, to put them in place. Um, so getting back to the, to the background here, when I say uh, the, the bill as it's written mandates that we get those greenhouse gas reductions at a certain level, it doesn't allow for anything in between uh, if we're going to be in compliance with the law. These are some of the numbers that we have to achieve. Uh, homes weatherized by 2025, we have to weatherize 69,000 more Vermont homes. We have to do 120,000 by 2030. Now, now, some of these have already been done, so the, the numbers are slightly inflated on this chart. That's the total that needs to be done. We've already done, I think, 30,000, so it's like 90,000 homes have to be weatherized between now and, and, uh, and 2030. Uh, heat pumps installed, you know, it's, it's, I think the number is now is 140,000 have to be done by 2030. Heat pump water heaters, 120,000 advanced. Well, it's a lot of work. This is, this is renovating existing housing stock. So if, if, you know, if, you, if, you know, if you've got a, a house that's old and drafty and is not well insulated, what they want you to do is they want you to insulate it, somebody to come to your house and insulate it, and they want you to switch out your oil or propane or natural gas heating system for an electric based uh, alternative, you know, most, the most prevalent one is a coal climate heat pump, or they want you to get an advanced wood pellet stove, something like that, something that isn't oil and gas. And this program is going to ostensibly subsidize your doing that as a homeowner. Now where the money comes from in order to get that subsidies is everybody who's still heating with oil and natural gas, propane, and kerosene. They're, I, so, which is a good segue into my lie number one about this bill. The clean heat standard is not a tax. It is a tax. In fact, the best description that I heard from this was from Dick McCormick, who's a senator from Windsor County, did vote for the bill, is, is very much on board with this agenda, but he even admitted, I don't understand how this bill works, right before he voted it on the committee. Uh, but he looked at it and he said, I'm looking at this and it is a Rube Goldberg contraption. Why don't we just pass a straightforward carbon tax? And that's exactly what this is. This is a Rube Goldberg carbon tax. And the reason that they are doing it as a Rube Goldberg carbon tax is because they're trying to avoid the accountability that would come with, we are passing a bill that will tax home heating fuel in a state that gets very cold in the winter time, uh, that is dependent, 80% of the people are dependent on this, we're gonna hit you with 70 cents a gallon or $1.20 a gallon or 30 cents a gallon. So they don't, wanna, they don't wanna have to say that they're passing a tax. So technically when they say it's not a tax, that's a semantic argument. They are correct, it's not a tax because the, the, the money never goes through the treasury. What they have is these carbon credits uh, what the, so the way the system will work, and this is a, it's basically an excise tax. We have a two cent per gallon tax on heating oil today. It's an excise tax. Um, and the way it works, and it pays for weatherization of homes. There's a program that goes to Efficiency Vermont and Capstone and I think some, and one, other, one other organization, non-governmental organization that does this work. It funds those programs. Uh, the way this would work is a fuel dealer who crosses the border, who, if you bring 
fossil fuel into the state, and it all comes into the state, we don't produce any here, whoever owns it at the time it crosses the border becomes an obligated party, and an obligated party has to buy these carbon credits. They don't actually look like this. I made this up one day when I was really bored. <laughs> but, <laughs> but they have to buy a carbon credit um, based on the amount of uh, uh, carbon that is put into the atmosphere uh, when the oil that they sell to you, the customer, is ultimately burned. Uh, how much that carbon credit cost is going to be based on how much money they need to raise in order to subsidize all that stuff from two slides ago. Uh, so whoever brings it across the border at the time, who owns it, owns the good. So that it could be a wholesaler, it could be a dealer, and this is, it creates a really unfair system because some dealers buy from wholesalers in Vermont. If you're in the interior or if you're in Burlington area and Chittenden County area, there's a wholesaler in Burlington that you drive your truck up to, fill it up, and drive off and, and sell to your customers. That dealer will not be an obligated party under this. The wholesaler will be. But if you're a dealer down here in Bennington County and you buy your fuel from a wholesaler in New York State or New Hampshire or Massachusetts, then you are an obligated party and you need to buy these credits. So some dealers, mostly the small dealers along the Connecticut River uh, border with New Hampshire, are going to have to pay the, this tax. And the ones that are around Chittenden County are, are going to have to, are, aren't. It's going to be on a larger wholesaler. So it creates an uneven playing field. But the, the reason this is a de facto excise tax is because having to buy the carbon credit uh, from a default delivery agent is probably going to be Efficiency Vermont. It was set up to be, a, if not Efficiency Vermont, a new organization like Efficiency Vermont. So instead of having our two cent tax on fuel that goes through the treasury, like a normal tax does, the excise tax, and they give it to Efficiency Vermont to perform these services, what they're saying is you have to give the money as a fuel dealer directly to Efficiency Vermont. So we don't touch it, it's not a tax, ha ha! But the consumer is paying just as if it were an excise tax. That's how it works, and it's not particularly honest way of going about it or an accountable way of going about it. Um, oh, here, I just explained uh, how this uh, would work. So we have the two cent, and here's what I'm going to bring in, which, which, which is going to get into the, the, the next piece of misinformation is the cost of this. So that two cent per gallon excise tax on heating oil, kerosene, and on dyed diesel brings in about $5 million a year. Um, and it pays for the weather, weatherization subsidies. So the clean heat standard would not impact dyed diesel. That doesn't count in this bill. And it does impact um, the propane and natural gas. So it's not a, entirely apples to apples, but, but two cents brings in $5 million. Uh, line number two, this will only cost pennies a gallon. It will not. Um, the Secretary of Natural Resources back in January did her back of the napkin calculation. And what she did is just skipping back to this. She said, OK, I'm looking at all of these things we have to pay for through this program, which is here. Uh, we know that the average weatherization job costs $10,500. We know that a heat pump costs about $5,000. A lot of houses need more than one heat pump. Um, and and she's, she came up with a number that it's going to cost $2 billion a year to do this work uh, over a four-year period between 2026 when the law takes effect and 2030 when we come to that first goal uh, that I outlined in the earlier slide about on a Global Warming Solutions Act 2030. Yes, sir. As a proud owner of a heat pump, uh, we only use it in the summer, but in the wintertime, it costs very much. You can't use it. <laughs> Yep, and I bet you in, are paying a bigger electricity bill on the yeah. air conditioning in the summertime than you otherwise would if you didn't have it. <laughs> Except that our wall air conditioners were not as effective as this. So the summer, it's a blessing, even the electricity goes, but the wintertime, it does not work. Yep, that, that's... Okay. You're that, a half a benefit. 
Yeah. That, that is, uh, we've heard a lot about that. I don't really get into that in this presentation about how this technology is not ready for prime time for, for a, a state that is far north as we do. But getting back to the, to the cost, she came up with $2 billion and she said, okay, we've got some federal money that we're expecting to come in through uh, uh, ARPA funds um, and there's from the uh, uh, IRA that is now under question with the debt uh, debt negotiations, but if that money comes in, she figured it'll and, and the money that people will some people will spend some of their own money to, to do this come out of your pocket. You put in the heat pumps. You did, maybe you got a subsidy or not, but certainly nothing along these lines. Uh, One point two billion dollars. So so that's three hundred million dollars a year in Vermont that we would be having to pay uh, in order to meet the obligations of this bill as defined by the Global Warming Solutions Act. Now, as I said, the two cent tax, and this is what they say, oh, this is only gonna cost a couple of cents. The two cent tax brings in $5 million, not $300 million. If you're gonna bring in $300 million, it's gonna be more than two cents. It's gonna be more than 10 cents. It's gonna be about $1.20 a gallon, $1.20. She came up with 70 cents, but my, my math brings it out to $1.20 a gallon. Um, again, this is what it has to pay for here. The other thing that they point to is, a, is Oregon. Uh, you'll hear this in their talking points as they come out and they say, well, hey, there's a similar program in Oregon and it only raised the tax on gasoline by about, and diesel by about seven cents a gallon. So, Already, you probably caught the apples and oranges here. This isn't a heating fuel standard. This is a motor fuel standard. Um, it raised the cost of seven, seven cents per gallon. And uh, as they testified before the House uh, Committee on Energy and Environment, the Oregon, they had the Oregon people in. The Oregon program raises about $50 million a year. $50 million a year from a seven cent per gallon tax on gasoline. Well. $50 million is not $300 million. Um, and Vermont's 640,000 people are not Oregon's 6.6 .6 million. So you have a, a state that has, uh, no, it's, it's 4.25 million, 6.6 6 .6 times the number of population uh, that we have in Vermont. So 6.6 6 .6 times the number of people paying seven cents a gallon raises one sixth of the amount of money that we would need in Vermont to pay for everything required by the Global Warming Solutions Act. So it's not going to be pennies. It's going to be a lot of money if we're going to fund this program. And, and this is, doesn't even touch on the, uh, the, the cost of um, the bureaucracy that's going to be necessary to do this program. All of those jobs, you know, I'll pop back for just uh, this. All of these jobs, the, the way that, I should talk for a minute about the clean heat credit system, credits. The way a credit is created, and it, this is important to understand, it's, they're not minted like money. I mean, there, there are programs that have these credits, like uh, the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative. Well, uh, those are for power companies that they can buy credits for polluting and then they sell them. Well, those, those credits are minted at a central location. You've got this or, the regional greenhouse gas company, or for lack of a better word, says, all right, we're going we're gonna to create $50 million worth of credits and we're going to sell them off uh, on January 1st and come to the auction and buy them. The way this system is, is being set up is that when you installed your heat pump, you have created for yourself, sir, a credit, or how, I don't know how many credits, because it will have to be determined based on the amount of CO2 your job prevented from entering the atmosphere. Somebody has to figure that out. Somebody has, you, you, you're gonna call somebody up or your contractor, whoever put it in for you, is gonna call somebody up and say, all right, we just installed two heat pumps and we weatherize this guy's attic and uh, send somebody down to figure out and tell me how many credits this is worth. A bureaucrat has to come down there, assign that credit amount to you, and then determine who owns it. Do you own it? 
Do, or does your contractor own it? Have you in, come into an agreement? All right, then they have to tell another place, somebody else, another bureaucrat, okay, this guy owns 10 credits and he's gonna sell them to this fuel dealer, Donnie Dorr, <laughs> is clamoring for this guy's clean heat credits so he can continue to sell oil to somebody else. Well, look at those numbers. Who's gonna figure out 120,000 jobs like this, assign a credit value to it, uh, assign a number of credits to it, assign the credit value, o assign ownership to it, track that ownership through its sale, and you know, if, if your system is supposed to last 15 years, then the credit goes on as long as that's supposed to, as long as it's working, and then it, and then it goes away. And then somebody's also got to calculate if they're going to do this honestly, hey, this guy's not even using it in the wintertime. <laughs> <laughs> so he's not taking any carbon out. In fact, he's probably putting some in because the electricity he's using is, being, is generating some carbon in the atmosphere. So that, that, th this, it, the bureaucracy that's going to be necessary to do this is going to be insanely huge if it's going to be done the way that, that they're laying it out in the bill. Uh, so that doesn't even you know, touch on any of those costs. Um, The estimated cost on the impact of heating fuel, so uh, there was, uh, the, the last point I'll make on, on this piece of misinformation is, you know, if they're, they're saying it's pennies, it's, it'll only be six or seven cents. They, they refer to the Oregon program quite often, and that's sort of their frame of reference, and everything else is a scare tactic. But uh, Representative Jim Harrison from just up the road in Chittenden County put an amendment on the floor uh, during this debate said, okay, well, why don't we just cap it at 20 cents per gallon? If you guys think it's seven cents or 10 cents, this should be a no-brainer. We'll just, if everybody's afraid that 70 cents is misinformation, let's put their minds at rest. Let's pass this amendment. We'll cap it at 20 cents per gallon. Uh, and you will have proved us wrong for everything we've said. Harrison's amendment failed on a roll call vote, 43 to 101. So roughly um, along party lines. Lie three, the clean heat standard will benefit the poor. This is the one that really makes me angry. And I, I write it, for those of you who don't, aren't aware, I write a column on Substack and I just wrote a, a, a very long, well, it says five minute read. So it's not that long uh, article explaining exactly why th this is just cruelly false. Because the money to pay for the program comes for people who currently heat with fossil fuels. As I said, that's, that, that's the way it works. The, the fossil fuel dealers buy the credit, they pass it along, the cost of that along to their customers. Uh, they have to, uh, they can't eat the, you know, two, this, you know, $2 billion over, over these little companies driving around in fuel trucks cannot absorb $2 billion uh, to, for their, for, you know, so their customers don't have to pay it. All of that cost gets pa passed along to you who continue to heat with oil, propane, natural gas, kerosene. Um, so the, who, who ends up in that category? It's people who do not want to change their heating systems and say, to heck with it, I'm gonna pay the extra money. And people who can't afford to change their heating systems even if they would like to. Now this is where we get to another big problem. I mean, everybody has seen the labor shortage issues that Vermont has been dealing with and all, all around the country, they've been dealing with labor shortage. You can't get you know, people to work in the restaurants, you can't get plumbers, you can't get people to come out to your house, handymen. Um, Jared Duvall, this is one of the lead architects of this plan. He's from the Energy Action Network. Uh, so all of this guy's incentives are to pass this thing. And even they are admitting, Vermont currently has about 700 weatherization workers. We have good reason to anticipate we will likely need somewhere in the range of 5,000 weatherization workers by sometime around the middle of this decade if we are to achieve the weatherization recommended recommendations of the Climate Action Plan. So we're 4,300 workers short or 14% of where we need to be on just weatherization. That doesn't include electric car hookups that they're talking about that they need to do. It's not expanding anything else. It's not building roads. It's not building bridges. We are 4,300 workers short just to do all that stuff from the previous couple of slides. Uh, 
there's you know testimony to this problem is that you know so okay you get your first bill and it's seven dollars a gallon instead of five fifty a gallon like it was this year which is already a very high price and you say I can't do this get me off the system I you win I will put in the home heating system well then you get a call uh, okay first of all if you're low income you got to prove your low income in order to get the subsidy. So here's your application. Send it in. We'll process that. We'll get back to you. Um, by the time all it gets processed, those 700 workers are going to be working for people who have the upfront cash to put in to do these jobs. Now, they say in the bill that they don't want that to happen. And I'll get to the, to the language. Uh, the bill does stipulate, and this is where they say this is how it's going to help poor people. It's the difference between language that appears in the bill and practical reality of what the bill is capable, what logistics are capable of doing. Uh, they say 16% of all the clean heat measures, the installations, the weatherizations, etc., must take place in low-income households, and another 16% each year uh, must come from either low-income households or middle-income households. But further down the paragraph in that. Legal language says, to the extent reasonably possible. And the Public Utilities Commission shall have the authority to change these percentages established for good cause. And the good cause is it's too expensive to do this for low income people and it's too complicated. It is too expensive to do it for low income people and it is too complicated to do it for low income people. And, and it's going to be both of those things. Because it, you know, if, you think, if you think about what's if there's 700 workers out there doing this, and you know, I am, you know, got the money in my pocket. Look, I've got twenty thousand dollars that I will invest up front to put this system in, so I can, you know, turn my oil furnace into a backup. Uh, can you be over tomorrow? Uh, or you've got this other person that says, "I am in the application process for a for a." Uh, a subsidy, can you wait a couple of weeks while I'm doing this? The, you know, who, who's going to get these jobs? They're, they're going to go there. And, you know, so you, and these waiting lists can be years. Just to illustrate this point, um, when I was uh, watching, my, my, I used to be in Lamoille County Senate District until this re redistricting, now I'm in Washington County. But my former senator is Richie Westman, and he's on the Appropriations Committee. And when this was in his committee, he told his committee members, look, you know, I bought a $20,000 uh, advanced wood heat, wood pellet system to do my part in this climate thing. This is one of the things that works in my house. The heat, heat pumps didn't work, but the pellet system would work. It's been sitting in my yard for two years waiting for somebody to come and hook it up. That's a center. That's a guy with some pull. <laughs> you know? If he can't get somebody to come out to his house to hook up this system, I mean, how do you think um, a lot of the low you know, low-income people who are you know, going to get gobsmacked by this thing, trying to figure out what's going on. You have to navigate the bureaucracy. You have to put the fund funding together. You have to find somebody to do it. Uh, they're just not going to be able to navigate this as quickly as people who have the resources uh, up front will be able to do it. And the, the sad thing is that the longer you're in the line, the more you pay for the people who are ahead of you in the line. Because they're going to get a subsidy. They're going to get the clean heat. Hey, I've got $20,000. I'll put my, I'll get my clean heat credits out and I'll sell them to Donnie Dorr. <laughs> and I'll get money out of the system. And meanwhile, it's the, it's the person uh, who can't afford to do that, doesn't have that time to do it. The other reason why it's going to really hurt low-income Vermonters, and it's highly regressive, is because low-income Vermonters are more likely to live in housing that is incompatible with the non-fossil fuel heating options. You cannot put heat pumps into a mobile home. 20,000 Vermonters, Vermont families, not just Vermonters, so it's, a, it's, it's a, a number larger than that, live in mobile homes around the state. And you can't do it. Uh, several contractors came in and they said that it's, uh, it, the, the, the electrical needs of the heat pump create a fire hazard. And when you put it in and you get rid of the other heating system, it, it creates a danger that the pipes will freeze in the wintertime. You can't do it. Uh, so, so these folks, not only the, you know, people who live in mobile homes, uh, they have to have an, a, 
most of the time, from what I understand from the testimony, they have to have an above ground fuel tank, which means in the winter you have to use kerosene so it doesn't gum up. Uh, kerosene is the most expensive of the fossil fuels. So the people who can least afford this are the ones who are going to be paying the highest amount and they are stuck in the system whether they like it or not. And that's just wrong. That is just absolutely wrong. But that's the policy. And the, the, you know, the other types of homes that are difficult for the, the, uh, you know, the, uh, the heat pumps are you know, poorly insulated farmhouses that aren't built on an open floor plan. I guess from what I understand, the way that the heat pumps work is if you've got a big open room like this, it'll heat it. But if you've got lots of little rooms, you need different heat pump for every room because the, the heat doesn't circulate or something. I'm not an expert in this. I'm just telling you what, they, what, the, what uh, the contractor said in the committee. But you know, an older, poorly insulated home needs to be really upgraded. Um, we had another senator, Senator Ann Cummings from Washington County, one of my new senators, said she had, she lives in a house like this, that it was brick, uh, an old brick farmhouse, and got an estimate was over $20,000 just for the heat pumps uh, to put, to put, if they were going to cut the holes in the brick wall and mount the heat pumps and she needed four or something like that. And the cost has gone up since she's done it. She, she voted for the bill and she voted to override the governor's veto today, knowing exactly what this is. And another type of, uh, another type of, of building that doesn't work well with, the, with this technology is, is multi-unit apartment buildings, we heard. So multi-unit apartment buildings. So if, if you know, you know, this is, you know, if you're renting, this is where, you know, a, a lot of, you know, lower income Vermonters live in conditions like this. And they will not be able to participate at all in this program. They're going to be paying for it without being able to participate in it, or it's going to cost them a whole lot of money in order to buy in because they're the most expensive um, alternatives for, for, for bringing in this, 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 kind of a, this kind of technology. So the last lie that I will bring up is that nothing can happen until the General Assembly votes on this in 2025. Now this is the check back and this is, you know, the Senator Sears who uh, from right here in Bennington County hung his vote in support of the bill and, uh, and against the, the governor's veto today uh, based on this check back. And it's really being sold as a study. And in fact, in his, in his remarks following the vote, Senator Sears said exactly this, this is basically a study. And uh, you know, they'll co it'll come back to us and, and, or whoever's in the legislature in 2025. And maybe this goes the way of single payer health care. And I, that's kind of the buzz that was around. You know, they all know that this is a bad bill. They all know that they can't afford this bill, but they're just neck deep in it with the activists and they don't want to pull the plug, so they're hoping it implodes between now and 2025. Who knows, maybe it will, but the check back um, is not a study. They're not, say, they're, they're not saying, okay, we're going to see how much this thing is really going to cost. Is it seven cents a gallon? Is it going to be 20 cents a gallon? Is it going to be 70 cents a gallon? Is it going to be $1.20 a gallon? Um, the Ethan Allen Institute where I used to work, uh, Myers Mermel did a study, said it's going to be $4 additional a gallon. We'll find out that. We'll find out what the bureaucracy looks like to do this clean heat um, uh, trading thing. I mean, it's, it's like a stock system. It's like a bank. You have to establish a bank for these, for these credits. They're going to figure out how that works and what the rules are going to be. And then you vote on it in 2025 if you move forward. That's not how it works. They're going to be building this system between now and 2025. They are going to hire the default delivery agent that's, re that's responsible for retiring all the clean heat credits. They are going to build the IT system for banking credits. In fact, you can start banking your credit. I don't know when you put it in your system, but if you did it in 2023, <laughs> it's retroactive for January. Keep your receipts because that's going to be eligible uh, for a clean heat uh, credit. So, they're, they're hiring six bureaucrats this year, three in, the, um, in uh, the Department of Public Services, three in the Public Utilities Commission. They're hiring, um, uh, well, they, they've, alloc they've allocated $250,000 to do a study of 
how much, how much it's all going to cost. But next year, in 2024, they sign the contract with the default delivery agent for up to 12 years. That's, that's in the bill. Why are you signing a contract for 12 years with an organization if, the, if this thing isn't going forward? Um, the only thing that they will vote on in 2025 is the final rules that the PUC puts forward in order to uh, operate the program. So there, it's basically you're building a house at the same time you're determining whether or not you can afford the house. And when the house is built, how many people are really going to say, yeah, no, we're not going to do this? So the, the check back, it is better. It is better than the original bill, which didn't have that in it at all. It was just going to say, here, you Public Utilities Commission, Department of Public Services, go forth and make this happen. And we never want to see, don't, don't darken our door again, because we don't want to be associated with this thing. Um, but, uh, but the check back, so the check back is better. They do have to vote on the, the final rules. Uh, but as I said again, it, the, the whole system will be built. It will be put in place and ready to go. And that's all they're voting on uh, in 2025. That's not the way it's been sold to, to the public. I don't think that's the way it was sold to Senator Sears, Senator Kitchell. But they bought into it. And, uh, and that is that. Um, those are the four points that I want to bring up. And at this point, I will open the floor to questions. I'm sure that you have stuff I can answer on different aspects of the bill. Right. Uh, you've asked some questions, so let me go to Joe first. So these things, it's always follow the money. Who's getting rich in this program? Well, uh, Burlington Electric is very much in favor of this because you know, you're, you're now using your heat pumps in the summertime. Uh, they're, they're, they're going to be banking on all the increased electric demand. In fact, I. I think I had a slide in here that I can show you. Yeah, power infrastructure. This, this is by 2050. That green line is what's supposed to happen to electricity. Where that electricity is going to come from, I don't really know, because I just saw an article that Hydro-Quebec does not have, they're not generating enough power to meet all of their contracts as it is. So that's our cheap source of electricity. So they're, they're banking on offshore wind, which is killing a lot of whales. And that may not happen. Uh, you know, the, a lot of the solar projects and wind projects in Vermont aren't particularly popular, particularly popular. So they may not happen. Uh, but yeah, no, Green Mountain Power, Green Mountain Power, Vermont Gas, ironically, is, is set themselves up to do very well under this system. Um, uh, does Vermont Gas have the ability to generate some gas company, I think, can generate credits for yeah. something that they produce out of state that never comes into the state. Yeah, that's, that's Vermont gas. That, that's the deal that they, they squared with this. And, uh, and then, of course, you know, the activist organizations are going to do really well out of this with the lawsuit provision. And I think, it, you know, cynically speaking, I think this was put in there for them to make their money to, for, you know, getting their people to come to the state house and protest and whatnot because uh, we can be sued if we don't meet these goals by anyone. That was written into the Global Warming Solution Act. Anyone can sue the state. So it gives standing. And what's going to happen is you're going to have the Conservation Law Foundation, which sued Massachusetts on a similar, uh, under a similar lawsuit. They're going to sue Vermont. Uh, they're going to raise a bunch of money. They're going to go out and say, hey, we need millions of dollars in order to hire the lawyers because they're destroying the planet against the law that they created. They need to be held accountable. They will raise that money. They will win the lawsuit because clearly we're not doing this. This is not going to happen. The, the logistics just aren't in place for it to happen. Uh, and then they will get their lawyer fees back, so they will keep the money that they raised to hire the lawyers. And it's kind of a circular scam. Uh, I want to get some people who haven't had a chance to ask a question. Yes, Carol? Yeah, I was going to ask, has Vermont thought yet where they're going to bury the solar cells? <laughs> they thought about that. The contamination on that is going to be under here. No, I, I, I haven't heard anything. I haven't followed that. I, what you're referring to is that there is a recycling problem with the, with the solar panels and with the wind turbine blades, too, from what I understand. I know. I mean, we don't, the one landfill that we have, I think, is full, and they don't like that one either. So, <laughs> yes, sir? My name is Jim Dan. I'd like to speak in addition to the answer that there are already two companies in both cases. Or doing the solar panels and in this state? In this country. 
You have to ship them someplace to have them. Are they rebuilding them or are they burying them? They are not burying them. They're taking out the good materials out of them. Aluminum frame, glass. And who's paying for that? Well, in certain cases, they are actually part of the price we might have. Is this okay? This is something done in this country because this most country. of the pilots are coming from China. That's right. They've been but coming from China for years. Buy it and it's part of the price. I didn't. I didn't all manufacturers in China. But just this particular manufacturer. There are a couple. Of them. There are a couple of. Maybe some Yeah, because they haven't been in business very long. Because the majority, of what you see in this country, is out of China. The pollution is unreal. So we're moving the hell out of China because we're sad. Yeah. Thank you for letting me get across the board during that conversation. It was very informative. Thank you. But I'd like to introduce three examples, if you don't mind, of projects that I've been involved in in this town where I look at these things from a pure economic point of view. Okay? Habitat resale store used 1,000 gallons of fuel oil a year for heat. Mm -hmm. We put in three heat pumps. This present year, not a drop of fuel oil used, including a minus 21 degree day. Heat pump worked fine for, for heating. Sorry, I don't know what the issue is in your particular example. The total cost of the three heat pumps is $12,000 in sold. Fuel oil right now is at 4.30 a gallon. And talk to you, sort of case 450 gallon, but let's use 430. So that's $4,300. The electricity needed to run those heat pumps for 12 months, $1,400. Savings in one year, over $2,900. Second example, my wife's office. We lost a uh, they lost, they lost a furnace uh, that they've had for, I don't know, 30, 35 years in the basement just prior to COVID starting. The example that you use, because talking about shortage of labor, was true in that case. We couldn't get anybody to put a furnace in, and I was an instigator in trying to get them to put in heat pumps. We put in two heat pumps with four heads each, which takes care of your multi-room situation that you're referring to. In a law office, and my wife's in there at minimum six days a week. The total system cost them $26,000, but it included an air conditioning system, which they didn't have. So now they can run year-round, okay? Just on an oil basis, uh, they did not use a lot of oil because they had had the, the building insulated several years ago. That $26,000 includes the full insulation of the building. So they spent, they were spending over a three-year period to answer your question about how do you figure out how the oil consumption is done, it's based on you have to provide three years worth of usage. You then put that against what during that year you save or don't save. If you don't, if you don't use it to offset oil, then no, you're not going to have anything. Yeah. In their case, they, so they uh, save over $1,600 a year. And that includes with a new AC system. Riley Rain. We put in 10 heat pumps. We put in four HRVs, and for those of you who don't know it, that's a heat recovery ventilation system. We had to put them out in our locker rooms because of the moisture content from showers. Total system, $110,000. This is uh, a little over four years ago. We offset, we used to use 22,000 gallons of propane from our warm our areas where we had the, some offices and stuff in the year. We now use less than 4,000 gallons of propane. Today's propane price, depending on how, how you want to calculate it, is roughly 350, 380, something like that a gallon. $63,000 a year of propane. In addition, one of my kids is an HVAC engineer. We put the heat pumps over the, uh, the condensing units over the ice surface. So instead of pulling outside air in, to, to move the heat out of it to the inside and took it over the ice surface. It cut our compressor runtime to make ice by over 40%. Between the two, we saved $71,000 a year at current prices. 
total cost was 110000 mm -hmm. So I look at it from an economic point of view. I'm not disagreeing with all your comments about labor shortages and all that sort of stuff. But first of all, this four-year system has been running, uh, this has been running all this time during plenty of cold times. Same thing with the other two buildings. So if you choose the right product, it will work in this one. Yeah, I'm, I'm not arguing with the technology, and I do think that that has oper uh, opportunities for savings over the long term for some people, but the amount of upfront costs you just described for three projects is going to have to be paid for by somebody and living in a mobile home through higher right. fuel costs. Right. 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 Borrow money, habitat, partial gift, borrow money. Uh, I understand that, that part of the, situ the situation, but what I'm getting at is in a very short period of time, a person who does this kind of work can get a, a payback. Whether we put on 70 cents or 2 cents or 7 cents or $4, every time we put a gallon of fuel oil in a furnace, we never get any money back. Well, I mean, that's actually not well, fair true. or true. If, if, if we were running like the electricity system for the fuel dealers, they have shrunk the amount of fuel through efficiency that their customers use significantly exactly. over the past couple of decades. Exactly, and that's my point is why don't, why don't uh, fuel oil dealers take on this opportunity to partially change their business model and do the heat pump work, do the insulation work. They could add a whole new realm to their, to their business model. And in most cases, like you said, they're smaller dealers. They have a sort of a geographic area of customers that they've been doing business with for 10, 20, 30 years. They have a great opportunity to look the other way and understand that the future is going to change, whether it's in this bill or not, because fuel fuel oil prices are not going to go down for a well, it could go down. Can I make a comment on that particular point? Sarah, you know, my name is Eric. I just have one comment, and I'd like your analysis. Thank you very much. The only thing you didn't account for is that electricity prices are going to jump enormously because there is not enough electricity to be produced in this state to accommodate all of this change. All right, well, and I'll be a little careful on this because it's a relation of mine. I have a son who tries to develop solar projects in this state. I helped him build solar projects on almost every possible roof in Bennington County. All those school districts get a discount on their solar through our arrangement. Okay. Right now, we can't get 500 kilowatt systems, which is what you're gonna need. You cannot get enough electricity, to your point, by building them on individual roofs. The math just doesn't work. I, I can't see the numbers on the graph there, so I don't, I don't understand. I can't see what the time schedule it's is. And I don't hours going from just about, just under five, six, five and a half or so, up to just under 12. Yeah, and I don't know how many years out of it. It goes to 2015. 2015. So 2018 and Okay, it's, it's calculated that we will need to at least double yeah. the megawatts that we need by the 2030 deadline if those things were implemented that we're talking about, cars and, and heat pumps. So my point is, we got a PUC right now that won't even approve a 500 kilowatt project. Now I'm not gonna get into all the visibility and all the other stuff about this, but every time we don't build a solar project in this state, we rely on natural gas to infill the shortage in ISO New England. And that is a fact. And I have that's an athletic choice. And that's, that's something that people need to get a hold of to understand, all right, if you choose not to look at them or whatever it is that your objection to them is, you're going to continue to do the infill of this electricity with natural gas, and you're going to make the problem worse. Yeah, and I, I also think, talking about making the problem worse, you're going to see a lot of people switching from oil to wood, which is just <laughs> worse. Which is even worse. It's not worse. It's not worse. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Carl. Um, yes, two things. One is we know that, um, that what has taken place in the prices of oil and gasoline is a manipulated move. 
So to put out the prices means nothing because that was manipulated. Gas was just, what, $2 a gallon just a short while ago and for our vehicles and our oil stuff. I remember when our, ga our oil prices were less than our gas prices. Now they're more than our gas prices. I don't understand that since you have to refine more to get gasoline than you do home heating fuel, but it is what it is. And the second thing is you gave us three examples, and all of those examples are not homes. And people are not in those buildings in the evening when the temperatures drop. And I'm sure that has a lot to do with what people are feeling, you know, who say it's not adequate because at, at night when they're in their homes, they're not moving around much, they need to be warm, it's not being adequate for them. So those are two points right, I want to make. Right. I don't, I don't want to get into an argument about the technology because that's not what we're here to discuss. But the, it's the you know, it's the financing. But this is this is forcing people to pay for other people's projects while they may not be able to afford their own uh, their own home heating situation, and they might not have the find the labor force being able to switch. They might not live in a house that's that's compatible with the new technology. There, there's a and it's not fair to somebody in that situation pay for you know a subsidy that somebody else who might be in a much better financial position than they are to begin with uh, help them make a move that will save them. Yeah, I, I think it will, you know you're going to save money on your oil bill and your heat bill, particularly if somebody else pays for your upfront <coughs> cost of installing all the all the heat pumps through a subsidy. Uh, if somebody paid the twenty thousand dollars to install the heat pumps. I'm saving money day one, but it's you're you're forcing somebody else to lose a lot of money in order to create that dynamic, and that's it's just not fair, in, in my opinion. Eric, well, just it's simple supply and demand. You know, if, if the supply of electricity stays the same, which apparently it's going to, but the demand for it goes up, the price of electricity is going to rise. Which, which we're already seeing. The price of electricity is going so up. We, we've been insulated from it a little bit in Vermont because we have a long-term contract with Hydro Quebec. But as I said, I saw a story that uh, Hydro Quebec uh, is saying that they're not generating enough power right now to meet all of the contracts that they've agreed to in the United States and meet their own Global Warming Solutions Act. Uh, Com and, and if you look at other New England states that don't have this contract, uh, places in Connecticut and Massachusetts, I was at the ISO New England, their, their, their latest meeting in, in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, and they're bewildered because their electricity costs have gone up 40%, 20%. Huh? Cost of natural gas? It, you're right, it, it, is, it, is, the, it is gas, it was, was the reason for it. We don't have, this is what I'm saying, we don't have control of that. Let's get control of our destiny. We don't, we don't have control. And how exactly give you control of your destiny? Yeah, you can't you control it. Yeah. You're not supplying the supply of electricity. is not there. Electricity is, is it done by... Right. Well, we, 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 well, we've gone an hour. So I, wanna, I do want to wrap things up too much before we just sort of devolve into, <laughs> into victory. So any questions about... The, the bill as you want for answers. Yeah. Good. Um, you've been checked back real quick for this group here, triple the size of it, because we put through that change in a legislative breakfast in Addison County. Chris Bray was there, we got all over it, and the next week when he came back, he put through the check back. So that put the brakes on this program just in a legislative breakfast. These are the people that make the difference, the people that show up for what you're talking about. Number two, we put in that heat pump back in 18. We downsized our house, built a new home. Everybody said, heat pumps are wonderful. We put it in, piece of junk. <laughs> Sorry. Now, they also have upgrades for it where you can use a better ingredient. So we are going to look at whether we want to upgrade and make one that because ours works down to a temperature about 32, and maybe we tried it down in the teens and whatever. It was a dog. Um, but they say you now have stuff that can go down below zero, so it might be more than five. Well, the technology is getting better. We and also, we have wood stove in the basement. We have a pellet furnace. We have propane. The only thing we don't have now is fuel oil. What I do buy dyed diesel fuel and I may come up with some sort of heating system running my tractor through the basement to the house, who knows how we'll do that. 
But there's one more thing here that really tweaks me. The, the wording of the uh, Global Warming Solutions Act is wonderful if we could ever get an honest court because it's based on greenhouse gas emissions. CO2 is not a greenhouse gas, not at the percent that it's in our atmosphere today. It needs to go 10 times what it is now before it can make any impact at all. It does not do it. That's the background of what we're doing, Rob, and we'd love to coordinate with you and put on a Q&A or whatever it would take. And there's a bunch of people up in our area that have this information. People need to understand it's a bogus, it's a hoax The CO2 is doing this. It has, no, it has no capacity to do this. It's minuscule. They've calmed everybody into believing it and they've said it so loud that people just buy into it and the people promoting it are not scientists. And we can get into the details anytime you're ready. Well, I, I don't want to get into the details of the, of the science of it, but I, I will say that even the proponents of the, the bill will admit this will do nothing. Uh, no, to no, 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 no. Uh, influence plant, plant. But there are some benefits out of following some of the things. A, a guy named Jim Murphy, who uh, tragically died a number of years ago, built a house totally off the grid. He put solar panels on it, he put generators in it, he had a whole series of things, and he put wood in it. And then he bought a ton, I mean, that's my number, I don't know how many it was, but we went in his basement, of car batteries in there. And he generated all his car batteries full. He built the house in such a way that it saved heat, absorbed heat, and radiated heat. I mean, the guy was almost a genius the way he did this. And then he was totally off grid, and he totally heated his house. And he had these, these um, car batteries that operated his house whenever there was no natural electricity from, from solar panels and so on. And I would like to get a little bit of that technology and put that in our basement as well. So there's all kinds of things you can do, but it's this mob that can make a difference. The mob can make a difference. Well, yes, just a, a couple of warnings to those people here that might be thinking about heat pump before they do it. I'm not saying it can't be done, but we either put in heat pumps in our house last year. One for a guest room that is used maybe 5% of the time. That one does just fine, can handle it and keep it heated and cooled. However, what we bought after we installed Revelation came out, they cannot heat below 60 degrees. So all year long, we have to keep a, a room heated at 60 degrees with a heat pump that's been used 5% of the time. The other one for the heat pump we put in, in our house uh, was designed by a big appliance to deal up in Rockland. And uh, whenever the temperature goes below 32 degrees, the heat pump shut off and the furnace goes on. That was not the idea, and we spent a lot more than twenty thousand dollars on this, and it was just a disaster. We have to totally rebuild the house to make this work. I'm not about to totally rebuild the twenty-year-old house. <laughs> uh, you and then Ralph and I think we'll, we'll call it a day if yes. that's okay with everyone. My apologies, but my husband has been installing heat pumps since the '80s, and we have a heat pump in our house, and we're nice and toasty the whole time. So I think it's really important if anybody wants to have a heat pump installed that you have an installer that really knows what he does, what he's doing, and that the the heat pump is sized right for the job it's trying to do because that makes all the difference. Yeah, and to that point, I think that you know, as I said, the technology is getting better, and there is technology that works in the right circumstance in Vermont, but you really do need to have a trained person. Uh, come in and figure all that stuff out, and go, going back to the lake, there just aren't very many of them here. Yeah. You know, yeah. We need 5,000, I think actually, since that quote, they upped it to over 6,000, um, is what we'll need. And from what I understand from the contractors who came in and testified on this bill multiple times, that the number's actually going to end up going down, because they're retired. The, the electricians and the plumbers, the master plumbers, are in their 50s, uh, generally speaking, and the young people coming up just aren't there, and they're not going to move into the state, uh, which is, you know, what a lot of the activists say, oh, you know, we're going to you know, charge or offer good wages and they're going to move in here. One, one of the gentlemen who testified, testified from, uh, uh, was in that, I was 62, I'm retired in three years, I don't know, 
see anybody coming up behind you, but you're not going to get people to move here because it's so expensive to live here. And this, ironically, is one of the problems, is we've got you know, high cost of living because of programs like this. Uh, it's going to cost you more to heat your home. Uh, there are other bills that they're passing. They're going to raise your property taxes. They're making harder to build homes. There isn't enough housing. Um, so, you know, you offer somebody $22, $25, $30 an hour, they're going to go to Tennessee where they can keep more of that money. Uh, Just mention, Rob, our system was designed by the, the web organization of Rockland and they're specialists in this. Yeah, so I mean, it, and it seems like I, I hear good stories, great stories, I hear bad stories, I hear okay stories, <laughs> you know, so it, I'm, sure, I'm sure that there's similar stories with you know, oil, oil furnace technology as well, you know. Go nuclear. Uh, but Go nuclear. <laughs> I don't know if I want a reactor in my house. <laughs> there it is. Yeah, oh, Ralph, I said Ralph. Next. Something that you mentioned, but really not didn't get into. The way this whole thing has been written, if it doesn't work, we can be sued, state, to be students, by virtually anybody in the world. Anybody. That, that's what's Anybody. Anybody. That was mentioned. And then, what happens? Well, then, well, it's really the, the, the loss of provision. I, I did touch on this. The loss of provision, I think, is really just a money giveaway to the activist organizations. Because the way it's written in the bill, normally, if everybody says, oh, well, you know, anybody can sue anybody at any time, which is true, but then you have to establish standing. And what this bill does is it gives standing to anybody to sue. Just one second. Uh, it, gives, it gives standing to anybody to sue. So, you know, yeah, anybody, you know, and the, the, the people who are going to sue, they know the Conservation Law Foundation. They're the ones who brought the case against Massachusetts. They're the ones who are going to do money. What the, what the Global Warming Solutions Act actually says is that they can't, even if the, they win the lawsuit, it does tie the hands of the judges or the courts. They can't prescribe anything. Uh, they can't say, well, now you have to do this, or now you have to do that. They, they will tell you, you got to go back to the drawing board, but they, they tell you. I mean, it's, it's a totally useless pro process. But it could be a very We're not making you delete this lawsuit from we the people who <laughs> sow the state of Vermont, get the money out of the state of Vermont, and get the money out of the And that's what I would say. They are. We know we should maybe But at least we neutralize it and come lawsuit. back to us and then go to somebody else. But, but the thing is, if, if we did it, we'd have to pay our lawyers and we could recoup our, our legal fees. That's all you get. There's no data. There's no monetary awards allowed. So, you know, it's not like uh, you can't sue for damages. All you do is you sue and you get your legal fees back. But the way that these organizations are going to do it is they're going to raise a ton of money from people to... I'm not talking about those organizations. I'm talking about what we said, we the people. If, I mean, it already shows a discrimination against the poor. Yeah. Don't we have some standing to be able to bring a suit against the state and say the law that you have just passed is one, unconstitutional, and two is is um, yes. Uh, Somebody can sue, but unfortunately, the law did not specifically give you standing to sue. So you have to count that standing in court. From my understanding, I'm not a lawyer, but that, that's how I understand it to work. Yes, I'm I'm wondering how they're going to enforce it. I mean, how on a local level, how do you go around? You go to each home and inspect it. And yeah, how well, do we enforce that, this? That's a really good point. And we'll, we'll probably get to this when they start putting the rules together. Manchester doesn't even have a bill. Uh, against you know, I don't know <laughs> so how I, I, see, I see that as, a, as the fatal flaw with the bill is when you somebody has to verify if all of these things happening or not. And if the answer is or not, then this is ripe for fraud. This is this is you know if, if you just say hey I, I put in a heat pump and insulated my house and nobody shows up and says okay well. <laughs> yeah, you did that. Uh, you know, you can you can you fake receipts. You can fake anything, and it, it really. But the, in order for this to be fraud proof, I mean, the bureaucracy is going to have to be huge. I mean, ninety thousand authorizations that have to be verified every year by by somebody. Exactly. Yes. Um, Senator Irene Reiner from Clinton North. Oh, thank you for your no vote. All the things I didn't know today. <laughs> thank you for your no vote. <laughs> well, thank you for driving down here. I want to meet you because I've read your articles for months and you've been very helpful and informed.
informing me and others as to what's really going on here. Mm -hmm. um, the Global Warming Solutions Act does have dates in it of not targets, right? They are benchmarks that we're supposed to be meeting in 2025, 2030, and 2040, I believe. I put in a bill several weeks ago, actually several months ago, to change those dates and push them out because if the legislature can set dates by which we can be sued, we can change those dates. That bill, of course, is still on the wall, as I said, in natural resources and energy, but at any time they can pull that bill off the wall and they can just push those dates out and prevent us from being sued, which was the big reason last year that we had to hurry up and pass this green heat standard. So there are other ways to resolve at least the lawsuit problem. Yeah. It's just that there hasn't been the political one to do that. So I just yeah. wanted to add that. That's why you came in late, but Mark Higley, Representative Higley, had an amendment to this that would have just removed that provision. And you know, anybody can sue, as you point out, it just removes the standing position uh, provision from it. But, but thank you for your vote. Thank you so much for driving all the way down here. <laughs> <laughs> it was nice to get out of class and not feel This is crazy. I got it. I was just going to say, I have a friend who is a Vermonter who said to me, don't worry about getting fuel. He said, I have a truck. I'll bring in my fuel and your fuel. Well, so you better realize that there's going to be. This, this is an enforcement issue. And, and I have heard other people say that I'm just going to take my tank across to New Hampshire and bring it back. Yeah. If you do that, you own that fuel. When it crosses the border, you become an obligated party. And you are responsible for buying the clean heat credits yeah, for the new prohibition coming up. So the next now, <laughs> they may not catch you, you do it in the dark of night. <laughs> they, they may never catch you doing it, but you'll be breaking the law. Well, not unless you save your own uh, credits from your heat pump. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you did, if you put it in credit, you could say, here are my credits for this propane. And then when the or propane oil, is off, you can do it again. <laughs> well, yeah. Well, who's going to take your credits? So well, you have, have, to have, have to have enough credits. Uh, I, again, we'll, we'll have to wait and see how the credit system works, but you, you will be Thank breaking the law. <laughs> Uh, you, <laughs> you, then you, then you. I said we were going to wrap up questions in like 15 minutes ago, but this is fun. I'll go as long as you guys want. This one's a, a bit of a side. It's more back to the bill I'm trying to get the veto upheld. And I'm wanting to know, would you be willing to call 20 people that have a conservative voting history and say, would you call your legislators? Would people do that? If you would, would you come see me? Let me tell you. I'll give you a list of 20 people from your town. If you'll give me your email address. Wait a second. Uh, we had an awful lot of people calling Sears, okay? And I called today and I asked the sergeant at arms how busy they were. They were very busy. So uh, it didn't make too much difference. Sears. Well, it, it, it didn't, but it's important. It's still important to do. It's still really important to do, and you know there there is a vote in the house. As I said, I, I think it's a it's a long shot that you flip any any minds at this point. Um, the pressure on you know the, the majority party is, is tremendous to pass this thing, but you know it, we live in a representative democracy, so make make your voice known. And if they don't listen to you, that tells you something too. Excuse Very me. What happens next? In the, now the bill is passed. What, what does the legislature do now? They have to wait for a two-year study. Has it yeah, uh, well, well, we still have one more vote. Yeah. Well, there's, that, there's, the, there's the veto override vote in the House, which is Thursday or Friday, from what I understand. Um, and then, as, if it passes, if, it, if the governor's veto is overridden, then um, the PUC jumps in right away, and they, they contract with, uh, they, they will hire their three bureaucrats at the, at the PUC, three bureaucrats at the Department of Public Service. The Department of Public Service will contract with somebody to do the study. Uh, the PUC will start writing the rules uh, on how this is going to be governed. Uh, in 2020, in January 2024, they will start looking for a default delivery agent uh, applications. In June 2024, they will contract with the default delivery agent. At some point along there, uh, they will have to contract with somebody to create the credit exchange, uh, which I, I think is going to be a hugely expensive IT uh, 
I don't know if they're going to pay for it in 2024. Maybe they're going to wait till 2025. But if it's if, if it's supposed to be implemented in 2026, somebody has to build that IT system. It's going to be very complicated. Does the legislature then have to vote to approve? Then, then no. Uh, they, the, the, this, this bill authorizes all of that to take place. Uh, what will happen then in 2025, January 2025? The Public Utilities Commission will have written the rules about how this is. They will hire the people, they built the system, their banking credits are retroactive to January 2023, and they will have written the rules on how the program is going to work. Then they would have to file them with the Secretary of State's office, in which case they would have then the force of law. So what this bill does is says, Instead of going through the normal procedure of filing the, the rules with the Secretary of State's office, it has to go back to the full legislature, both houses of the General Assembly, like a regular bill, and go to the governor for you know potential veto to approve the rules in order to file them with the Secretary of State, whether we take on the force of law. So that that's you know better than it was. The, the check back, but still, all that other stuff happens between between now and then. And I'm not even sure what happens if the General Assembly doesn't take it up. And you have these bureaucrats hired, the, the ball delivery agent hired, the, the IT system in place. The the PUC has issued order. They have the authority to issue order. rules and orders are different. Something I learned in this process, <laughs> and they have the authority to write rules. Uh, under what just is you know being passed right now, they do not have the authority to file rules. Did I say that right, or did I get backwards? They have the authority to write orders. They don't have the authority to write rules. Uh, so you know, are, will the system continue under orders? They have to. They don't have the authority to implement final rules. Does that mean that they are able to operate under temporary rules? I don't know the answer to these. It's, it's a mess. I mean, if they wanted it to be a study bill, they should have just made it a study bill, stripped all the stuff out, given the PUC $250,000 of the Department of Public Services, $250,000, they will hire somebody to do a study, like Rand did. Rand did a great study on the, uh, the child care situation. Um, they came up, it was thick as a phone book. And you know, it's like, okay, we have a plan, we want to have child care for birth to five, what's it gonna do, what's it gonna take? They came back with a plan and it said, it's going to cost, I forget how much money, but it's, you, need, you need a payroll tax, you need the candy tax, you need this to pay for this, that, and the other thing. And they looked at it and said, <laughs> we're going to do something more scaled down than this. <laughs> Which they, and that should be the process for, for this. You know, let's look at it. You know, can we do this? Do we have to, how, what can we do with the labor force we have? What can we do with the revenue that we have? How can we? I mean, you know, people are living in, the, in mobile homes that can't, you know, transition away, you know, that, that's a problem that needs to be solved. Not saying we got to forget about these people, you know, and, you know, leave them to their, you know, you know, the situation that they're in, but let's figure out reasonable ways to, to operate with the resources that we have. Um, that, that's not what's happening here. It's really bad government. Follow up on the previous comment. You know, we've got a very small window for a really bad odds gamble to lock this thing down. Most of us in this room are indebted to poor Kathleen James. She's been lying to us for months about, oh, it, it may only cost 10 cents a gallon because Oregon did it for seven. The numbers you put up there, we need to throw back at her that the Oregon cost is 277 a gallon to generate $300 million based on our population. Kathleen, we cannot afford this. Seth, puppy dog that follows Kathleen, we cannot afford this. And they're not going to listen to us, but we need to try. All right, last one, for real. I got to go back to Stella. <laughs> I really got to go back to Jimmy County. No, just one bit. If we just, if we, we get oh, okay, sure. out and through the house and nothing changes, can we still put pressure to repeal yeah. this bill? Um, well, can we sign petitions and, and say we want this repealed? You're yeah, going about of it course. Way. I mean, uh, of course you can. And in fact, you know, the, I, I see, to, you know, if, if this passes or, or you know, the, the governor's veto is overridden by the House and this goes forward, I really see it as a beginning and not an end because we do have the process of the PUC and the, and the Department of Public Service doing the, the potential study, coming up with the rules. We're going to be able to see what they come up with and we'll be able to comment on that and we'll be able to get back to our legislators and say, hey, look, we passed this and this is what they're saying it's going to cost. 
So that's when you start putting the pressure on now uh, and constantly uh, to, to uh, when that check back comes up to first uh, reject the rules and second to repeal it. <laughs> There's that too. <laughs> All right, thank you everybody. This has been a lot of fun.